So hello, everybody. My name is Maria Evans. I'm the Artistic Director for the Arts Council of Princeton, and I am happy to welcome you to another In Conversation. So tonight, our host, Tim Andrews, who is our um, supporter for our Artist in Resident program and is a, a um, former member of the board for the Arts Council and for McCarter and is a great art supporter in our area is going to be interviewing Maria de Los Angeles. And uh, Maria is the curator and an artist in our current show in our Chaplin Gallery, which is called A Voice to Be Heard. And it has um, some incredible work in it. And I, it's funny, I, I um, most people wonder how I meet artists or select artists for shows and, Maria uh, contacted me because she had been in the um, Sonoma Museum. And at the time, our uh, former executive director, Jeff Nathanson, met Maria. And uh, Maria was moving back here to New Jersey, where um, her, she and her husband live. And he said, you should contact Maria Evans at the Arts Council. She did. We met. She put in a show proposal. The proposal was dynamite, which you'll see after the talk and when you visit the gallery and um we've been we've been communicating ever since so i'm really really delighted to be working with her so um it's uh it's a bit after seven what i want to do is turn it over to uh, maria and tim so that we can get the benefit of this hour and um there's tim thank you everybody enjoy the show i'm gonna log off and i'll join you at the end Great, thank you, Maria. Thanks for the introduction. So Maria, it's great to meet you. You too. So uh, let's get started. Um, you know, I usually like to start with just sort of the beginning. So tell us more about yourself and where you grew up and sort of your early influences in art. Uh, well, um, I guess I can start where I was born. I guess that's always the beginning. The true beginning is that I was born in uh, the Cambaro Michoacan, which I haven't visited since I was a one month old baby. Um, but it is in Michoacan in Mexico. And um, we, we lived in, in the area, but never really visited there. They're famous for making sweets, like kind of fruit, like sweets. And um, we, we lived in, um, in Campeche, uh, we lived in Tabasco. Um, we kind of lived all over Mexico before moving to um, around the age of 11 to Santa Rosa, California. And um, was your father moving around in, or your mother for work or what was the movement of them? Well, in Mexico, we had property in um, a few different states, like kind of family mm -hmm. land. And um, so we moved um, just from one to the other one to, to kind of manage it. Um, and then um, I lived in Santa Rosa until I came to school at Pratt Institute. So I attended middle school and high school there. Okay. And what about art? When did you first, what's your first memory of being exposed or starting to, to participate as an artist? Well, <clears throat> the first time that I did it competitively, I think, you know, for the audience mm -hmm. um, was a competition where I had to make a drawing. And that was, I think it was around eight or nine. Um, maybe nine actually. And uh, it was a, a drawing competition in school. Um, but the most amazing art that I saw, the first sort of incredible thing was the Olmec um, sculptures, the Olmec heads mm -hmm. and, um, and this park where it has all these um, uh, objects that, that are still around of the Olmec um, culture. And, uh, and that was amazing. And that was in Viermosa, Tabasco where they have um, a lot of artifacts uh, from then. So that was a that was an early exposure and an early impression. What what do you think captured your imagination with those with those artifacts? Well, I was little, so I was like this little skinny girl, and I'm walking up to this Olmec heads, and they're just giant, um, and the way that they were carved, and um, just it was so different for me to see those. Um, it was really special, and they kind of they stayed in my mind for mm -hmm. until now still. Yeah, those early memories that people have of their first art experience and exposure. And do you do you remember then thinking, you know, I really want to create art 
uh, or was it more of the, the size and the scope that was so you know interesting? Um, I think it was just impressive. Um, it, you know, they kind of appeared in front of me. I was on, on a tour with students and just the approach, the different distances. Um, and just that this had been created by someone. And obviously we don't know too much. We know a little bit, um, but I didn't, I guess I didn't really think about being an artist. Um, uh, that decision came on later on in life. Mm -hmm. So then you came to Santa Rosa. And uh, so tell us about life there. What was life there like? It was good. Santa Rosa is, is kind of, I think it's like New Jersey. I feel like there's some similarities like in, in Santa Rosa and California, especially Northern California to New Jersey. I don't know, the architecture is all mostly kind of smaller and, mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of, there are some beautiful mountains and all of this, but just sort of the people, I feel like there's a similar feeling um, and it was beautiful. I mean, um, just the vineyards and the redwoods and um, the wine. And there are some cultural celebrations there, like a Laguetza's and uh, yeah, it was all new to me. Uh, I didn't, when, I, when we moved here, I didn't speak English or anything. So it was a big, big learning experience. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you sort of then engage in art? Was that in grade school or when do you really remember getting into it after that? That, can, that after that competition at such an early age, what what then kept bringing you into art? Well, um, that competition happened um, when I was in second grade, hmm. and um, and I was uh, I was a little older because my parents moved a lot in Mexico, and so I was uh, I was older, but I was in second grade, and then I moved here to seventh grade, so I had a, a huge jump in my hmm. education. So I missed most of elementary oh, school. Wow. Wow. Yeah, most people don't know that, yeah, um, but, but yeah, I, I tested out and um, and was placed in seventh grade. Um, and that's when I started to take some more art classes here in Santa Rosa, actually, uh, at uh, Lawrence Cook Middle School, where I went to middle school, right when I arrived from Mexico. Hmm. And were you drawing or what kind of art were you doing? Because you, you have such an array of kinds of arts that you engage in now. What was your first, you know, what was the first love of, of, of media? Yeah, my first love was ceramics, um, and I made a lot of marionettes, uh, string puppets. Oh. And I was I was trying to find the string puppet. I have it in my storage, but I didn't have a photo of it, so I kind of missed out on those. But that was my that was like my first thing. And be, before that, um, I used to draw my horses a lot in Mexico, so I would draw nature. Mm -hmm. But my first like real material experience, hmm. besides just being able to draw, right, was mm -hmm. making marionettes. Interesting. And why do you think marionettes? Was that some sort of storytelling or what were you doing with them? What, what was the draw to marionettes, you think? It was, a, it was a ceramics project and we got to sculpt out the faces and the head mm -hmm. and we had to, we got to make the clothing. And when I make these garments, I think of those marionettes, obviously there's no bodies yet, but um, it was just something that I, I really loved making them and move them around. And I sold two of them. And then um, I went back to Santa Rosa a, a few years ago and, and I got two of them back because I made several of them. Someone gave them back to me. And so I have them and it's fun to look at them because um, I think that they look like my drawings now, some of them. Hmm. Um, yeah. Hmm. That is great. Well, so you graduated from high school and sort of what happened then? Tell us more about your, your path, your journey. Yeah, so I, I graduated from element, uh, from sorry, from middle school, and that was a big achievement because uh, in those in two years I learned um, more science, mathematics, English. Um, I also took Spanish for Spanish speakers um, because I did have some knowledge, but it wasn't uh, super advanced. Mm -hmm. um, and then I graduated. I graduated with um, good grades. I did all the extra credit possible, and I was always like in the tutorial center getting support. Um, because it was a huge thing knowing like a zero, no words in English to getting a whole education, seventh and eighth grade in English was, um, was very intense actually. Uh, and luckily I graduated, I got, I got some nice awards, you know, all these diplomas, they used to give you this little piece of paper that says like achievement. It had just different um, things, you know, um, GPA. Mm -hmm. And um, my teachers really supported me because I, again, it, it was a, not only a, a, an education gap, but it was also 
um, just English, right? The language. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Elsie Allen High School, which was like the poor high school, um, the, the one that had no funding or had less funding. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people from my background went there and also people who, not necessarily just Latinos, but people who are lower or who are in the area. It's interesting how um, the education system segregates people by economic wealth and mm -hmm. somehow the money from the whole town doesn't circulate to this one specific area. Um, mm -hmm. So I went to Elsie Allen High School, which was founded after Elsie Allen, Native American basket weaver, uh, basket maker, mm -hmm. and um, just beautiful history. One day I hope to do a mural for, for the school. Um, but, you know, it was challenging. And I think the, all the teachers really cared for us. They were really supportive. And that's where I started to I could never get into the painting class because I wasn't, I don't know how they tested it or there was like not enough room for me. So I was stuck in the sculpture class and um, making copper, low relief co copper sculptures and um, making molds. And I finally, um, senior year, I got really fed up and I was like, I am transferring myself out of here. I can't take a painting class, I'm out. And I walked over to the other section of town and I enrolled myself. I don't know how I did it alone, but I enrolled myself in the um, San Rosa High School, um, which is close to the college. Um, and I attended there for a year and graduated from, from San Rosa High School. And so did they have ceramic classes uh, in the high school or no? And, and it's so odd that you couldn't get in the drawing class and you're such you know, a great artist. Is it, well, I wonder what was going on there. I think there was just a lot of students and there weren't enough faculty and um, and I just maybe my, my work wasn't as good. It wasn't really that good at the beginning. Um, but, you know, I, out of my frustration after three years of um, of trying to make it into the drawing and painting class, I was like, OK, I am doing this. And uh, I think it was a good move. You know, uh, I transferred uh, to the other high school. They had an arts program. They also had the local regular arts teacher which actually at the end of the day I learned more from her than mm -hmm. from the arts program because the, um, everyone in the arts program had already been there for three years um, and they were already finishing up doing their slideshows you know how you used to like have to get slides of course yeah your senior year you had to put together your slideshow of your work I guess from yeah yeah and I didn't have any of it because I had just transferred and um, and there was the other teacher who um, who was instrumental in like helping me develop my work and um you know and since I was undocumented people didn't really I didn't really think about college and I had a really good GPA but nobody really spoke to me about going mm -hmm. to college when I was a high school student mm -hmm. um and I had a boyfriend who was going to school with me there and he was like I am going to the SRJC why don't you come with me and we'll take painting classes and there's a cool art department. Um, but it was interesting to me that even though I had over a 3.5 GPA that nobody ever um, mm. mentioned the idea of me going to university. At all, you think that's were undocumented or you think it was some other? They didn't know I was, it was just a complete dismissal of my potential. Hmm. And yeah, and it were... happens a lot, you know, I think it was cultural, maybe they didn't expect me to do it. I think sometimes people expect different things from us based on how we look. Hmm. So you think it's because you were a woman because you were from Mexico? And what, what kind of, anyway, I guess we won't know, but- I think maybe because you just didn't think about it and who talks to you about college, your parents or your teachers. And, um, and so I sat at the graduation line and there was like thousands of students and I saw each one and every time someone came up, sometimes they announced what college they were going to. Mm. And I just wasn't part of that conversation, the, the university conversation. And what were you expecting you would do after graduating from high school? If it, if it wasn't college, was it working somewhere or what was your, what was, what was your path? That... I didn't have one because I didn't really have the guidance that I needed. Mm -hmm. um, all I knew was that I liked to draw and paint. And, um, you know, my friend who happened to be my boyfriend at the time was, oh, like, why don't you, and then he, I didn't even know about the college. He was like, why don't you come to SRJC and take classes with me? I'm doing the same thing. And then I'm going to transfer from there to another school. And so, so I followed, I followed him. I was like, sure, let's do this. <laughs> so that was the community college, right? That was the community college. Sarah's a junior college. Yes. And did they have a good art program? So you really were pulled into an art program or was it not as good as maybe it could have, you know, that you would, you would have wanted? No, um, I didn't know what was out there in the world. Um, San Rosa Junior College is amazing. They have one of the best 
is one of the best colleges in California or even in the country. Um, I guess it's a similar reputation to what would be a great college here. Like people say great things about Brooklyn College. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like that. It's really epic. Um, and they have a huge art program. They have printmaking. They have they had sculpture. Michael McGinnis was mm -hmm. a teacher there, and he makes those. Has anyone seen these mobiles that look like a globe and you rotate them? There's a marble in it and you can get the marble to go through the globe in different ways. No, but anyway, he's, he's, a, he's an inventor basically. And it was amazing that he was my teacher because we would make all this kind of, um, you know, he was teaching us how to like, not only just make sculpture, but make sculpture that was interactive. Um, it, it's a great program um, it, and it was cheap. Uh, I don't know if I was like $25 a credit I don't know, something really, really cheap um, and I could attend and I could attend even if I was undocumented to that program, to the SRJC. That's great. And so you went there for one or two years before you transferred to- uh, No. <laughs> you went longer, okay. I was, I have, I have over a hundred credits from SRJC. I was there for almost four years until my teacher, um, Alan Esedarian, who taught figurative drawing was like, why are you still here? <laughs> he like he like round me up on the hallway it's kind of dark lit hallway hallway and right out of the classroom and he's like a he was like a parent to me and he's like why why are you still here like everyone else gone like my friend my best friend Amelia went to call arts everyone just sort of dispersed um and then I had to be like um you know I don't know what to do next and then I had to tell him that I was undocumented I think that was the first time that I was like uh, you know, I can't go, I'm undocumented. He's like, what? Um, Cause he was like, always didn't take a no for an answer. He's one of those people. <laughs> and, um, and then that's how the conversation of me going to university began, you know? And so how did you, did you have to get documentation before you go to university or did it not really matter? Or what was that process? Well, here's the thing. Um, so that year, that must've been like around 2010. Um, I applied for three schools. Cooper Union, because we knew that it was free if you got in. Mm -hmm. So that was like, I wanted that. I wanted it and I didn't get it. Um, so that was like one of those things. I still have friends that went there. And I'm like, oh, I cry a little bit. <laughs> um, but Cooper Union, um, CC, um, California, no, Oregon College of Arts and Crafts or something like that. They closed down um, mm. like a year ago. They just shut down. I applied for that. And then I also applied for one other thing. Oh, um, the San, I think it was the San Francisco kind of institute thing. Oh, no, no, it was the other one. It, yeah, San Francisco Institute, institute of Art. I, I think so. I don't remember for sure right now, but um, I didn't get into Call Arts. I mean, not Call Arts. I didn't get into Cooper and I didn't get into the other thing, but I got into the Oregon College of Arts and Crafts and they were so excited about me going there. And then they were like talking to me about funding. And then, and then they realized I was undocumented and they were like, you can't come here because you're undocumented. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure if it was exactly because I was undocumented or because they didn't know how to fund it, but I was so hurt because I think in the email it said, you're undocumented, you can't come here, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought, well, that's the truth. I can't go to anything. I'm going to stay here forever. Mm -hmm. And Alan was like, no, you have to go. Like that's you have to go to university. And then the second time he made me apply for like 11 schools. Um, so I applied to lots of them. Um, I got the UC system, um, you know, applied to, I got into Berkeley, which was my top choice. If you're in right. California, Berkeley is like. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. Um, thank you. But you ended up not going there. No, because um, I got into Berkeley College of Arts in Chicago. Chicago Art Institute, which was a good choice. And my friend went there and I was like, what is it like? But they only gave me a, a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. um, I also got into several UC system schools and um, I didn't get into Cal Arts, which was another one that I was like looking at. Um, I got into Pratt. Um, I got like a good number back that were like, yes, we want you. Now I couldn't go to Berkeley. So it was at the end of the whole conversation, I made phone calls to everyone and it was between um, Pratt and Berkeley. Um, and I wanted obviously being home closer to my family, that was like a good thing. Um, but um, because I was undocumented and it was before the California Dream Act and before there was any funding for undocumented students, um, I could get a free application to apply to all of the UC system and get into all of it, but I couldn't get any funding, mm -hmm. nothing. 
because no. of a, um, a state funding, right? Or FAFSA or any of that. I don't call for any of that. So I called Pratt and I called someone named Judy Aaron, who now passed away sadly um, last year. Um, and I just like, I don't know what I said to her on the phone. Well, at the end of the conversation, I convinced her to talk to people to give me money. And they, um, they found out that they could give me half of tuition, which I don't know, tuition must have been like around 40 something thousand, 45, maybe close to 50. And they gave me like 25,000 or something like, I don't remember. I can look at my emails, the exact number. And they're like, you have to match the difference. So you went to Pratt, so you must have matched the difference. Yeah, and I remember running into Alan in the outside of campus, this beautiful redwood trees um, mm -hmm. all over campus. And I was, he's like, how did it go? And I was like, um, I, I got some funding from Pratt. Um, they're giving me half. And he's like, what's the difference? And I was gonna, I said like something like over 25,000. And he looked at me and he's like, how are you gonna do that? Because mm -hmm. he was really aware that like, I mean, for most people, that is a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was, I didn't have any. Um, and I was like, Alan, I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you figure it out? Um, so I got support. Basically, um, some very wealthy person was just like, here's $25,000. Um, mm. Go to school. No, I'm kidding. Oh, um, that, that would be a good story. <laughs> no, um, Jack Lysering, who owns a Jack Lysering collection in Santa Rosa, which has beautiful work um, in it. It's a private collection. Um, I, a friend of ours, another artist, Jim Spitzer, was like, why don't you talk to Jack? Jack was kind of like in town. He's just a very famous collector, mm. bought a lot of art. So he had a reputation. And um, Jimmy Spitzer, who's passed away also, was like, talk to Jack. Maybe he'll have some ideas for you. And so it turned out that Jack helped me out because he hosted art shows every, every weekend for like a month. And then Paradise Rich Winery, the owners also hosted one art show for me at the winery. And um, through a series of art shows during the summer, that summer, I was able to, um, to come up with the difference. Wow, so you funded yourself, self-funding by selling your own art. I mean, there's so many artists that have never sold art really, you know, early in their career. And you were able to sell enough to, to fund your, your years at Pratt or your first year at least at Pratt. So that's- really Yeah, and um, I got help from the Press Democrat. Um, Chris Smith wrote an article, basically inviting people to come over to the studio and find something they liked and support. And, um, and friends kind of came through and I sold a lot of my student work from Santa Rosa Junior College. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's out there in the world. Um, <laughs> once in a while, someone sends me a picture and it's like, look at your work, it's still right here. Um, <laughs> They're very, they're lucky collectors to have your work. Yeah, I mean, I sold my first piece in seventh grade. I sold the Marion, one of the marionettes. Hmm. Um, and I think I didn't realize that I wanted to be an artist. I didn't really know what it meant. Um, I just, uh, in seventh grade, I realized that I could make something that someone wanted um, and that I could make $50 out of it. And that was a lot because, you know, minimum wage, I don't know if it was like eight bucks or, Probably you know, I'd look. <laughs> So, so I was like, well, I can make something, someone wants it, and I can get this much money for it. Um, and it was just sort of this, this thing, right? I, you just, you produce something someone wants. It seemed like a kind of epic moment as a seventh grader. There's so many, you know, it's interesting because there's so many artists that struggle with that, I think, that struggle with the idea that they can, you know, you know, pay, you know, they'll, they'll be paid for their art. I mean, and, and sort of coming to terms of how to manage that. So it's it's very interesting to me that you at that young age were sort of, I wanna create something and then I wanna sell it and get money. And that is very unlike many other artists that I've met in my life. Well, I didn't know that you could do that. I discovered it. I, I Someone saw me working on it and was like, and then I was also making a pastel drawing of palm trees. And mm. one person was like, oh, can I, can I buy that? It was a woman and I don't remember her name. And I was like, sure. Uh, and then she offered me, I don't know what it was. It must have been like $20, $30. I don't know at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized this. So then I went and make the puppets. People saw them. And, and even my um, Miss Peter Peterson, um, I used to call her Miss Patterson because I, I, I always get those two mixed because I learned it in Spanish. She would, um, she would just like, you know, 
saw this puppet and she was like, can I buy it? And I think they knew that I didn't have much money. And I think people did it because they loved it, but also because they wanted to support. Mm -hmm. And uh, the drawing that you have is the first slide today. Yeah. I, that was just, I used to draw people at random, just like on the street and they would ask for it and I would give it away. Oh, so there's dozens of people around, you know, California with, with art, with your name, I guess. I even did that um, in New York when I was a student. I would just be in the train. I would be sketching people in the train. And once in a while, they would ask for it. And sometimes they would try to give me money for it, um, mm -hmm. whatever they had in their pocket. So, um, you know, drawing for me has always been a kind of important way to translate the world. <laughs> well, let's, let's go to some of your work now. Uh, and, and you were kind enough to share a lot of work. I'm, I'm going to go through a lot, but, but let's start. And I think this is the one you're referring. So I'm going to now share my screen with some luck here. And, uh, and we also had a comment from someone that I just wanted to share, which was, um, let's see if I can find that. We'll have to find that in a second because I think somehow I've lost the comment area. Um, so tell us about this. You, I think you just said this is one of your earlier works. So tell us about this, about this piece. Yeah, um, I did this randomly for a friend uh, or someone that I didn't know that I know now. I'm actually develop a relationship um, with them. Um, and it was just like something in the street. Like I saw them, I saw the, this girl and she was just so beautiful and had this uh, amazing kind of face structure and uh, beautiful black hair. And obviously the line is not, and I did this in like five minutes and I gave it to the person. Mm. So let's see if we can move to the next one here. Let's see how this is going to work. Here we go. Oh, uh, you want me to talk about this? These are figurative yeah. drawing exercises. Yeah, just from sure we'll go through a few of them, but just generally, sure. Yeah, so um, these are contour, like cross hatching type of figurative drawings with uh, Conti Crayon on Newsprint that I did um, when I started to study the human form with Alan Asadarian at San Jose Junior College. So this must have been like 20 minute drawings. Hmm. And this is right, those drawings are right after high school. So that's what it was very the early. beginning, you know, very early. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is my first painting that was like huge. So that's like four feet by four feet. And it was in oils. Um, and it's, um, I did that in my painting class. Uh, I looked at some photos, a friend had somehow traveled to Cuba and had some photo series that the, my friend had done and uh, allowed me to make a painting from one of the photo series. And uh, this was the first time that I was able to really get a huge brush and kind of move it around. Um, and this was in Lafredo, Michael Lafredo's class at SRJC. Um, I really love this painting. It's even more bright and it's oil, so it has this nice sheen to it um, in real life, yeah. To tackle is your first oil painting, a four foot by four foot piece is pretty astonishing, really. Yeah, I, I felt when I worked small, I feel so like, unless I'm drawing on paper, but mm -hmm. if I'm painting with a brush, I tend to feel really tight. Um, and so I've learned to manage that. I can work on more compressed images, but I really love huge scale. Um, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and this is also huge scale? Yeah, so that must have been like, maybe like around, not so big, maybe like around um, 50 something by like 70 something. Um, and this was when I was um, kind of figuring out how to make an abstract painting. And it's funny enough that it has flowers in it because nowadays I make a lot of work with flowers, but yes, this was, um, and this was in oils. I worked in oils all the way till graduate school. And this looks like it's probably pastels is my guess. Yeah, so this is my um, a model and I did this in pastels on like a, a type of um, harder material, almost like um, drawing hmm. board from like a drawing board, yeah. Hmm. And it's uh, pastels with a little bit of water to kind of move it around a little sponge. So sort of in the back area? Is, is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I really love that kind of work. I haven't done um, full nude uh, drawings in a long time. Um, it, you know, there was a lot of conversation about why would I want to do a nude drawing? Um, you know, it's kind of objectifying, but I think there's something beautiful about the human form. And these are some of my favorite drawings from that time. 
And this is also your sort of early 20s, probably? Yeah, so I was still in, at the San Jose Junior College, just before Pratt. Mm -hmm. And this was my first, so this painting was sold um, in 2010 or so when I was fundraising for, for school. And um, I took a painting that somebody else had made from like a, like a garage sale. It was an oil painting and it just um, didn't have anything on it. It was like during that time where everyone made like really abstract work with just some lines and some color. And I took it and I painted right over it. And I mm -hmm. made this vase of flowers and actually our friend who bought it. And this was the most expensive work at that fundraiser event. Um, she still has it. And when I come to California, um, sometimes I get to see it at Robin's house. And Robin, funny enough, was the first person to give me an easel. So in seventh grade, she brought me like a Christmas present mm -hmm. and it was an easel with like the whole kind of painting set. I still have the easel here. And is she a friend or she was a contemporary? Was she a, a classmate or was she an older person that just wanted to sort of support and, 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 and encourage you? She was uh, best friends with my younger sister and um, she would just bring, bring us like gifts for Christmas. And she, she learned like what each person wanted. And she's also an artist, so she's a painter and lives in, in Northern California herself. Mm -hmm. um, and these are um, on brown paper and they're charcoal with a little bit of color. And I included this uh, because I really love them. I feel like at the time, maybe, obviously, they were just sort of simple figurative studies. Um, but I think now with my new kind of compositional sense, and narrative story storytelling kind of thinking that one day I want to return to them, but there are just charcoal, a Conti, a little pastel and um, white, white um, Conti. And again, for everyone who is here, um, uh, Tim just selected, there was like two folders and I had no idea what was going to be <laughs> in the presentation today. There's a lot um, more too. I love this, I love this painting. Yeah, I think, this one for me is probably truly my favorite painting um, because of the feeling of it. It just has a certain presence. It's like beautiful and to me, like, I don't know, what do you see, Tim? It just is beautiful and so innocent and just looks like a child just, I don't know, just new and open in the world. I love the, the eyes are so wide and open and look like they're just taking everything in around her. You know, just, I don't know. I just love the, the work and the colors are beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, this was a painting that I worked on for a long time. You can see lots of layers and, um, and it just kind of arrived at this image. Um, and I, when I look at it, I love the physicality of the oil paint. So I hope to paint in oils again. Um, and I have no idea who has it, who has this painting. Mm -hmm. It was sold during um, one of the fundraisers. And your, 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 um, your methodology seems different from painting to painting. So here, was this a brush or was this something else you were using? Do you recall what your, what your method is? Yeah. Um, it looks like it almost not, might not be a brush. It might be something else. I don't know. I think it was like a, like a sponge or something. Yeah. Um, something big. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. I, I saw this picture in the folder. Um, someone. Um, Jack Lyserin sent me a collection of images because um, he was more savvy and kept track of my work um, during the fundraiser events. And um, I'm now working on a big mural for um, Glen Ellen, California, and I get to paint a semi-pastoral landscape. And mm -hmm. so, um, so I've been thinking a lot about this painting now that I looked at it because, Tim, you asked for some images. And I love the fact that it is both figurative and kind of semi-abstract. Mm -hmm. I just watched the new Vincent van Gogh movie by mm -hmm. Schnabels, and um, it's just so beautiful, the way that they kind of speak about the landscape in the van Gogh movie. And I think for me, the landscape in Mexico, but also the landscape in California is so important. Um, and I don't know, the figure is both very present, like it's there, but I feel like, like it's a little bit abstract. Like it kind of collapses sometimes. I would love to know what your thoughts are on the painting. I mean, I think you you capture the image so well and you're, you're right. I mean, it, and when I first saw it, I, I think I didn't actually see him, you know, and then and then it's so clear. And, you know, I just think it's, and the colors are beautiful and they really capture that landscape. You know, the California landscape is, is so burst of color everywhere. And especially when they're growing, you know, 
grapes or whatever is going on, you know, it just, I think the color here is, is astonishing, really. Yeah, um, well, it's really impossible to not um, think about, that there's just so much color in California, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and I'm also very interested in labor. I feel like for a long time, I drew the, co the workers at the coffee shop, at Mike's coffee shop at Pratt. Like I just draw, I love the images of people working because I think there's just something so honest about it and so nurturing to the land, you know? And as I work on this mural right now, I'm contemplating all of that, the, the long history of agriculture and stuff in, in California. Hmm. Oh yeah, so I did, um, there are two authors that um, teach at NYU and actually live in one of those buildings. And they were friends with Jack Lyserine, uh, Polsky. M Milton. Um, Milton asked me to commission me. So he actually paid me a fee to make some drawings for a book about the history of the village area. Hmm. Um, and this was one of the drawings. And he, I'd never seen the, the Picasso sculpture. He just sent me pictures and I had to make ink drawings of various Im images, like the bitter end and like various um, locations in the area of, in New York. Hmm. So that was a commission. <laughs> Um, this is one of my favorites. Even now, I don't know if I have a pen. I like to draw with pen and ink, and mm -hmm. um, I've discovered Pentel, Pentel archival pens, but I also like to draw with a metal point. And this was um, at Three Graces. I was really interested in mythology in like 2011. And those are the Three Graces, and I, I just love it. Um, I love to make very small marks sometimes, but I, am, I feel like it, it has a certain rhythm to it. Um, that is present and that technique is present from my kind of background in learning pre-making, learning etching, dry mm -hmm. point. Um, it, it was sort of a dress rehearsal for, for dry point and um, soft ground. Soft ground is really my favorite. Yeah, so that's one of the announcements <laughs> from, from Jack's um, exhibition series oh. of my work. And finally, we have printmaking. We've, I think we've had everything but wearables. We'll get to wearable in a minute. But uh, we've, we've covered drawing and painting, and now we're into printmaking. Yeah, so this is a, um, a reduction print, um, wood block. And in, in this case, actually, I think it was um, MDF, which I hear might be toxic. But I've carved a lot of MDF in my life. Um, I took some pre-making classes at SRJC. And then at Pratt, I had Dennis Magnet, um, who is a famous pre-maker and performance um, kind of art person. Uh, he's famous for like wolves and, and that kind of thing. And he was a student at Pratt and then was teaching pre-making when I was at Pratt, took his class. And so he has a very present carved in his work. You mm -hmm. can see that the, the carving for him is not like you would see from a Rembrandt or someone with it, it's where it's really precise um, engraving. Um, woodblock for him is more like an expressionist mark making. So basically, if you're a woodblock artist, you probably feel like this is somewhat tiny bit sloppy, but I, I like the fact that it is more gestural and not always fully correct. And basically you, you carve, you print one color, you carve, you print another color and so on until you get to the last color, which usually is the black. So this is, how many colors is this? Is this two colors or is this more I think it's, colors, maybe three? I think it might be three because um, the paper is one. Mm -hmm. And you can see that I was learning. You can see the misregistration. But that's, I think, charming. I think that misregistration, you know, I mean, Andy Warhol was not always perfect on his registration, as we know. So let's, uh, I'm going to stop the share now. We're going to, we've got a couple of questions that I want to get to before we go further. Um, someone's comment, Rose's comment, just people, artists, Artists often struggle with the concept of their own value, the value of their work. This gets back to the commentary about how you were selling your work at such an early age. And I think that is really, I think artists do need to feel more confident in their work. Um, you know, again, you know, you had that really early on that you really valued what you were doing because I well, guess- Well, I don't, I don't know if I- Maybe others, if I, maybe others, maybe others were valuing it. Is that, is that really what the, it was happening? Well, I didn't really know. I, I have, I'm a, I'm a faculty now and um, when we're young, we don't really know how much we should charge for our work. Mm -hmm. um, I think people always um, kind of approach me and then I had to do that. Like that was the only way to pay for undergrad and to get to school, to get to New York. I had to come up with this money 
and um, I had guidance and then I'd sold a lot of work. I mean, mm -hmm. I pretty much sold all of my work from SRJC and some of my Pratt work um, because I needed the money and I would do all these shows. And obviously it was like, I sold it a little bit under value from what it would maybe would have been sold if I had like even a greater awareness of the art market, mm -hmm. but which is fine because so many people could afford it and they did it out of love and they love the work. They're not like flipping it. Um, they're, they're, it's their work for their home, you know? Yeah. Someone else asked, um, uh, what would you, what would be your advice for all the undocumented students who struggle to go to college because of their status? And have you ever been involved in any initiatives to help students? Yeah, so that's something that I do. I do a lot of presentations about like options, a lot of college oriented presentations. Um, I, I do a lot of workshops with museums and different things. And um, I participate in a lot of protests and just like a little bit of a little bit of radio interviews, a little bit of each uh, at every level. Um, I think uh, I feel like it's easy to feel discouraged, mm -hmm. to give up. And I think that there um, there's always a place that might be willing to help you get funded for your schooling and not to just because nowadays some states have funding that you can qualify for FAFSA um, and some states don't. So uh, private schools also have a huge endowment. So I really recommend that people really look for the options to see what is best. One thing that is happening in places that do allow FAFSA and government funding is that um, a whole generation of kids are becoming, they're going to owe so much money. Mm. They're never like almost never going to pay it off. And that there's very little education about that kind of level of, um, it's almost difficult because at some point they might not be able to afford a home or things like that. And that's something that's happening to not just undocumented students, to everyone, mm -hmm. but especially first generation students. We don't have a lot of knowledge about the finances of it all. And one of the reasons why I don't have a student's loans because I didn't qualify for loans at the time. But if I had qualified, I'm sure that I would have been offered max amount and that I would have like three to four hundred thousand dollars in debt right now. Hundreds of thousands, you could have had hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. It would have been amazing. Well, Pratt is three years, uh, over fifty thousand per year, and then graduate school. Yeah. And I saved some money because SRJC was uh, very, very cheap. Um, but if if you summarize all of my education, which is for seven years, eight, nine years of education, we would be looking at at least a half a million dollars, probably. Mm -hmm. mm, it's amazing. And especially for artists, it can be daunting because maybe they, you know, because they maybe haven't found that way to sell their work while we're, while they're so young. So it's you even hard, you know, to sell your work like all the time. But I, what I wanted to say to that point is that there are still private schools you don't always have like if I had gone to UC Berkeley I couldn't at the time but now I could get a loan to go there um it still applied to private schools that have um, endowments I, I really recommend that and then there's also outside funding with funding within the school and then sometimes and you, you hit up every single office I was considering an international student at Pratt and I would just like talk to everyone one year someone stole money at Pratt like one of the bookkeepers and I came back to campus and my money was gone. Like my scholarships are like wiped and I'm there. I just arrived and they're like, you have nothing. Um, someone had was kind of skimming off the, the student money. Um, so just, you know, ask everyone and then also apply for outside foundation money, like from other organizations. Great, great advice. Um, so let's, uh, now we're going to shift to, well, you then went to Yale, so you graduated from Pratt, and then how quickly did you go to Yale? Because uh, you, you earned your um, BFA at Pratt and then went on for your MFA at, at Yale. So what was that process like? And then we're going to get into some of your art and we're going to be wrapping up in about 15 minutes. So Yeah, so um, I attended Pratt, I graduated in 2015 from Pratt. And um, one of the things that happened, and I don't, only the work that people bought survived from my Pratt years because we had a huge fire and our building basically burned down and all of my work was destroyed. Um, mm -hmm. So only, but I'm kind of excited because some of it wasn't good, but I did lose <laughs> a lot of my work. Well, maybe, um, maybe not to you, but I think to some of us watching, we would have been very happy to have it. So Yeah, so I, um, that was one of the things, you know, um, I, I lost like a lot of my notebooks. I lost uh, all of my sketchbooks and um, probably over like 2000 pieces 
maybe more um, in the prep buyer. And only the work that people purchased in the summers when they needed uh, to make a little bit of money has survived. So one day when I have a retrospective, I have to just like hit up everyone. <laughs> like, I, need, I need some of that work. Um, but yeah, so uh, when I finished Pratt, I was still very confused. Um, I think that there, one of the things that I'm kind of sad in some ways, but that I get to contribute to nowadays was that in, in the departments that I went to school, there wasn't anyone really like me. Any other faculty that was like teaching, that was like an artist, like, had a kind of mixed identity or Mexican or Latin American or Latinx or whatever you, everyone wants to call us. Um, so I didn't really get to explore my heritage side um, in school and some mm -hmm. of the conversations about being undocumented or about immigration, about all these kinds of things, I wasn't able to really have, um, which I think would have been really fantastic. And it wasn't until I went to graduate school at Yale that I was able to kind of bring up these things that I wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I finished Pratt in 2013, I didn't really know what to do. And um, I was like, I'm going to apply to grad school. So I applied to RISD, um, Yale and New York Academy of Art um, to, to go to grad school. And I didn't get into RISD, um, and, which was okay, because I got into RISD for undergrad and I, the dorms are so expensive. That's what I remember looking at the dorm prices and being like, whoa, RISD <laughs> is really expensive. And they wouldn't give me funding for undergrad, but I applied for grad school, didn't get in. And, and my competition was between New York Academy of Art and, and Yale University. So I got the interview. I don't know if everyone knows how that works. You submit your work, they look at your work, they go through the slideshow, kind of left and right. And then um, they pick, and then they pick a certain number of people, like under 100. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they interview, and you have to go in person to that interview. And um, Sheila Pepe, who is an artist and was a faculty at, well, was part of Pratt community, um, put us at the Yale Study Hotel, my friend Milo and I, and we carried my canvases in the train on stretch with the wooden frames because I was like, oh I'm not gonna, God. I'm not gonna like, my work is gonna look good. Right. And so I, there I am at the Yale School. I have my, my rubber mallet, my stretcher of art, Pliers. It's probably big, right? It's probably because your work it tends to be so big. So, so was it, you know, massive, massive art? Yeah, and we we had this um, because of the fires. Um, <laughs> we had a show at the Seagrams sponsored by Gagosian. So I had one or two pieces that I knew were kind of good. And I get there, and I'm like in the hallway, and someone's like, "Oh my god, you're crazy!" And some faculty starts giggling as he walks away um, because every, I was literally stretching the work in front of the whether I had to drop it off but you know what like I was like I, I this is my only shot like I got to do this correctly mm -hmm. and then I get to the interview everything set up like the other um assistants for the interviews were students who were currently enrolled and they saw me doing all this they must have think oh Maria is so intense and um and then my interview was with Marie Lorenz who's a, a performance slash pre-making artist installation and then there was Sam Messer um, the artist Sam Messer who draws and makes prints and all of that. And I had this huge paintings and then I had two sketchbooks with little drawings like from the cafes and like a few prints in there, you know? Um, and he gravitated towards the sketchbooks and um, the paintings were really expressionist, almost abstract. So like think of Lee Krasner, but with like more angst. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was the way I was painting. Cause I, I was very surrealist because I, I didn't really know what I wanted to say, but I, it was a feeling. So these paintings had this kind of power in them. And he looks at them and he's like, where's the work that you submitted for the portfolio? And I was like, I burned down. And then they start making, and he makes a joke. He's like, huh, it's like, you know, and I was like, I was like, it wasn't that good. It's gone. And he's just, you know, he's a kind of funny person that I love him. He's a great person. But, you know, I was just like, he was expecting something from me, the work that was in the portfolio and the work had already been destroyed. And um, I don't know. And then when I walked away from the meeting, um, I kind of knew I got in. You just had a feeling or did he sort of say, say no. And, and so luckily you had images of all your work though. So you were able to submit your images and you still had the images, I guess, of the work during that. Practice. They already had the images from before the fire with which my thesis exhibition for Pratt basically. And yeah. uh, they put us in this gymnasium um, and they built these fake studios in there. And, um, and basically all the work had been burned. And I was just like, whatever, I'm just gonna take a giant brush 
and I'm gonna move paint around and um and I was kind of I think we were all depressed and we were all like we had like you know how we lived through the pandemic we all have these feelings from it that was like our own personal pandemic you know we were ready for our senior shows and the work just burnt we wake up one morning and everything's gone um and then we went through this kind of traumatizing experience of being moved from gallery to gallery to a gymnasium with like weird lighting it was like a sci-fi episode um <laughs> and so I think that the work was um probably a little bit stress um but mm-hmm. uh I, yeah I knew when nobody said anything to me you don't know you just wait for the email but um when I finished my interview it just seemed like the people who interviewed me were the people that like I connected with mm-hmm. and sometimes you don't connect with uh with the interviewers and you don't get in and people get sad you know um mm-hmm. but it's just the wrong person you know sometimes yeah the wrong connection so we're yeah. going to screen again we've got a few more questions but we, we're going to share some we've got a lot of other pieces that i wanted to share so we'll see how many we can sort of buzz through here uh so- yeah so these are a sample from um my series called migration story that i have going on and it's basically just like a giant sketchbook We, we lost you, Tim. Great. Yep. No, I'm back. Sorry. I just had a little technical issue here, but I think I'm okay. Uh, let me bring my video back. Okay. Uh, someone asked, you know, in the, in the chat, how many, how many pieces of art do you create in a, a year? Because you're talking about what sounds like really a lot of volume. So what's, and I don't know how one would even measure that because it depends on, I'm sure what the work really is, but how would you respond to that question? Well, I would say that I make about, um, in terms of painting, like this large scale painting, you can see it behind me. This yeah. painting had taken me, um, I started this painting when I used to have a studio at Mana before, at Mana Contemporary, because I was a part of the Mana residency. And mm-hmm. they gave me a free studio basically for two years. And I was able to start this work and it was right out of graduate school, 2015. And I didn't really know what to do. Um, I got a teaching gig at Pratt. And Mana Contemporary um, and an artist, Ray Smith and Sam Messer kind of made the connection as well. And so I had a studio and I started that painting in 2015 and I finished it now. Um, so that painting is like over five years of labor into it. And when right after graduate school, I started to make dresses. So the material for this dress is actually material, upholstery material off the walls of the British Museum in New Haven. They were remodeling and they gave us all these rolls of this kind of tan material. And I used it to create a giant wall installation, like covering all the rooms in my, all the walls in my studio at Yale. And when the installation came down, I didn't know what to do with it. And then I I made a dress from it. Um, So this is called family dress. And this photo is actually from New York Mag. uh, New York Magazine did a a feature on my work um, back then. So is this fabric or is from the, so is this fabric and then, is the art on the fabric all yours or was something on the fabric already? No, I painted the whole thing. I draped it, um, I stitch it, um, and it is a type of upholstery material. Like, um, hmm. mus- it's not muslin, it's like very thick. Um, and then the material itself is primed uh, with clear primer um, mm-hmm. and everything has been applied with a brush. And what brought you from, you know, drawing, painting, printmaking, and to now wearable, you know, there's a lot of wearable art in your work. What, what was sort of that transition like? Well, um, a friend of mine who graduated from Yale, who's a photographer, and I were thinking of do- doing a photo series. And um, she tried to take a portrait of me, kind of like, who am I as an identity, as a person, um, culturally, and at this moment in time. And um, I got all my textiles from like Mexico that people have given me because I haven't been to Mexico yet since I left. And, and I wanted to create this identity, but it looked more like uh, one of my beloveds, uh, Frida Kahlo. And so I decided to make a garment that would embody me to take the photo. Hmm. And that's sort of how that conversation started. And from there, I just started to make garments. And at first it was like crazy. I'm here, here I am. I have all these paintings in my studio going and I'm spending all this time stitching paper together and, and gluing things and making this sort of random garments. I have no fashion history, um, no fashion background. I didn't study it. It's and this cool. is at the Museo del Barrio, the previous one during, uh, be back in five minutes, this type of residency where you were actually, your studio was inside the museum exhibition room. Hmm. 
And I did a performance, I called it illegal fashion, and it was sort of a political statement. And each garment had a different symbolism and imagery on it. And I would invite people to perform in the garments. And these are my friends, volunteers uh, performing in my work. And they're made out of, some are paper, some are canvas, some are Tyvek, rice paper, and then this kind of lightweight cloth. So your, your work in, in all, you know, is sort of about migration and sort of belonging and identity. Um, you know, were you drawn to that, you think, because of your own identity and your own migration? I mean, that maybe that's, that's such an obvious answer maybe for me to, to pose as a question, but, or do you think there's something else there? Well, I feel like um, I'm interested in like, also like stereotype and um, how we kind of take people's humanity based on like one aspect of their identity. Um, so I think there's a larger conversation going on, but I think, you know, and oh, my friend made paper flowers. Oh my God. Um, so, you know, there are some, um, I think there are larger kind of overall human experience questions in my work, um, but I do, I am interested in this connection to the land and this intersection of um, who we are, what we want and the politics and the law behind all of the questions that we're talking about right now. Um, so I think it's always been there actually, when I was much younger and freshman in high school, I participated in the National History Day competition. And I wrote a research paper about immigration in the United States. Um, I think it's always kind of, I mm. saw so much kind of prejudice and um, just the fact that people couldn't become legalized and still can't, mm -hmm. um, it just baffles me um, because I think it's a type of economic exploitation, really keeping people legally unable to move forward you know, holding them in that position of trauma. And mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, I also think about that kind of psychological trauma and sometimes in a more surreal way, like you see here. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would be actually happy to know what you have to say about this painting because usually people don't write much about my work and I want to hear what you have to say. I was going to ask more questions about the painting, actually. Uh, and first, you know, it's, it's sort of essential when you, when you get an image or you see an image, it's hard to tell. Is this, it looks like it's just beautiful scale and huge scale. Is this? So this, this is 50 inches by about 72 inches. And it's currently at the Dean's Fine Arts, uh, the Fine Arts Dean's office at Pratt Institute. Um, he, uh, he has a, a loan, on loan. <laughs> so it's, it's like a window, it's like a door. It's pretty big, you know, it has a presence. Um, and it has, uh, it's acrylic multiple layers actually it used to be a different painting and you can see there's a star and there's an area that has kind of yellow with blue in it and mm -hmm. you can see that it has some stuff that is more solid and some things that are more applied like a like a watercolor so it was a very different painting and I transformed it because I wasn't happy with it so this painting I worked on for four years just, just evolving it you just revisit 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 but now it's finished I think so someone posted, Margaret posted, your work is stunning. Will you go to the Philadelphia's Barnes Foundation's show? And then thank you for discussing the rough economic choices and challenges young people face when applying to college and graduate school. Oh, I love the Barnes. Um, there are so many pieces there. Um, I love Hieronymus Bosch. And I think that there's a mini Bosch painting. And I got yelled at by the guards um, because I was trying to really get into it. But the Barnes is amazing. I also love um, the Rodin Museum. Mm -hmm. Because I have a soft spot for sculpture, and I know that I haven't really gotten there as a as a kind of grown up artist, but one day I will make sculpture again. Okay, we're going to go through a few here, kind of. Oh, this one is my favorite. This is actually from my graduate show. Um, it was sort of yeah, from like right around graduate show at, Pratt, at Yale. Um, I used to paint a little bit thinner with more watercolor, and um, and I, I really got into making the speech bubble paintings, and this is. Um, migrants at the border upside down um, and it's like a person telling the story of how they cross the border and mm -hmm. and then there's like more activity uh, going on in, in the stuff outside of the bubble so it's sort of a juxtaposition between the internalized speech the kind of experience in the bubble and this other kind of montage of experiences outside of it mm -hmm. beautiful and this is in the Mana, Mana Contemporary, uh, Mana Residency Collection, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the identity dress. Um, it's a Filipino shape from a Filipino kind of 
um, design from a long time ago, and it was made, um, the dress before was made um, for a show that I did recently. And that's the most embroidered, most processed piece that I've done. It has even um, digital print in it. It looks incredibly intricate, incredibly intricate. All of Thank you. I dig, dig, um, repurposed a whole American flag for it. I think we have another picture of that. So these are, uh, let's just sort of go forward here. So this, where is this show? This was a Schneider Museum of Art in Ashland, Oregon. Um, the director, Scott Mulburn, invited me to do an installation and we installed over 1500 works on paper on the walls and they're all covered. And then these three large scale sculptures um, in the middle. And it was called Transcending Myth. This dress is, um, a, a, it's kind of like a form based on Virgen de Guadalupe as a type of protector. Um, and then it has um, lots of imagery and text, um, stenciling, and um, the cape is stitched. And then on the cape where the stitch mark is, there's also text mm -hmm. in, embedded in that. I still love this one, the last one. It's in my it's in my bedroom. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. So this is the one that you used an entire uh, flag. Yeah. So you can see the lines. Those mm -hmm. are parts of the flag. Um, one of those um, veteran centers was going had a whole box of flags, and they don't want to. Obviously, there's a kind of thing about not destroying a flag and what you do once it's been processed by the sun and it's been sitting out there and I asked if they could donate them to me for an artwork. And um, I had a, I have a whole box. I still have a few left of flags from this donation I got. Um, so this painting, I feel like it's the beginning of my new style. I feel like the last two before are have a combination of my kind of more expressive abstraction and some line. And this is the first one where I was able to really layer the imagery um, in a kind of a compressed way. and um, this is in the collection of Pedro Toledo in Northern California. And it's big too. It's like 56, 57 by like over 76 potentially. Mm -hmm. I have to remember. Um, this was at St. John's College, um, St. John's University, sorry. Mm -hmm. And the curator uh, was really amazing. Um, really kind of pushed me forward to think about how to display the garments. And I think that this was um, just beautiful. Um, it makes me think about if I would do the garments, um, not only of recycled cloth based materials, but potentially start thinking about ceramic or fiberglass or something lightweight, mm -hmm. um, just different materials, because I love the way that it's suspended. Um, I'm still sorting out the torso that the display mount um, of the garments, you know, that's something that I'm also thinking about. Let's move to, I think we've got a few here at the end that is of the current exhibition in the Arts Council, I think. And if I'm not, if I'm remembering properly, we're going through a lot of great work and um, you can reference your um, your Instagram and, and this is beautiful too, I love this piece. Oh, thank you. Um, and the photographs are actually, that photograph was taken by my husband, um, the photographer, Ryan Bonilla. Um, and we've been collaborating on a photo video series that um, I hope to present one day in the show. Um, so, you know, um, he, he's been really fun to work with. And I think you can actually play the video, but you don't have to. <laughs> and yeah, again, this is another photograph in a new garment um, that I made. And this is in Hoboken at the skate park overlooking the city and, um, and this photograph series has only been exhibited virtually so far. Um, I hope to make them part of an exhibition series with the garments, um, this sort of wearable image. Um, and I'm still thinking about what I mean by me kind of embodying this persona. And that's currently in my studio, the last one. And this is, that, that was at the Museum of Sonoma County during my solo show um, in 2019. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up here in a couple of minutes. Let me just check comments. If anybody has any more comments or questions they'd like to post, pop them in here. Uh, lots of just, you know, great work. Maria, love all you're doing. Another question, you know, what is your average output of artwork? I think the comment about 15 pieces of your or 1500 pieces of work 
in that in that one installation probably got people wondering the same thing that I well I have boxes I have this little crate this little plastic crates with drawings um I think uh, one way to think about it is that I make maybe one or two garments I think a year and then I make um I have a sketchbook drawing practice so those those mm -hmm. kind of add up but I noticed that I'm only really able to produce about 10 to 12 about 10 nice size paintings like that um, a year because they take time for me to like um, the fastest I was able to make a painting the other day was six I made a good painting in six months the painting in the museum in the arts council um, at uh, you know Princeton that's that took me about five to six months great and um, so let's bring Maria back the other Maria let's bring the other Maria back and just as a reminder um, this Maria was our curator and uh, a featured artist in the current um, uh, installation at McCarter um, called A Voice to Be Heard. And there's, I think you have a painting, a drawing, and then the wearable, a large wearables piece, I think. So if we get Maria back, Maria, you want to wrap us up here? Hi. And can, I, can I make a comment? Sorry. I want to invite sure. everyone to come see the exhibition because we have really amazing artists in, in the show, um, A Voice to Be Heard. And it's really people um, that are making work that I have a connection to and that I, I admire their work. And there's many more. I wish I could just do like, all of the people I admire would never be, it would be like a five-year exhibition series. But, um, you know, Shelter Sarah, um, Bouquet Savi, um, Joyce Kosloff, who I was an um, artist assistant at her studio for a while, as how we met. Um, then Ryan Bonilla, um, Marta Tuttle, um, and uh, Fernell Morris. Um, just, you know, I just and really Adam, want to, Adam Moss. And, and then the last one, Adam Moss, and I want, I put that one on the last because Adam Moss's first exhibition uh, as an artist um, ever. So Adam, um, I don't know if you're here, um, but yeah, I'm just really excited and grateful. And also I pressure Adam to be in the show and he, he has beautiful work in the exhibition and everyone else does too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you went through that list of names, Maria. I was, I was going to go through that, but you did a better job. <laughs> so this has been a really, really um, engaging conversation. So uh, it's, it, you, like Maria said, you have to come see the show. And tomorrow night, we are having a virtual opening for A Voice to Be Heard. So you can catch all the artists plus Maria, and I'll be in the gallery showing the artwork. So that starts at seven tomorrow night. And we would love to have everyone there. Um, you can also learn more about Maria at her Instagram and uh, she's all over the internet and featured live in our gallery. So thank you so much for, for being our guest tonight and as being our, our, our trusty host, Tim, thank you. I did wanna mention that um, our current artist and resident, Robin Resch, her residency installation will open up tomorrow in Dome Alley. So um, we'll be putting the finishing touches on that all week and uh, we invite everyone to come to Dome Alley. That will be uh, on view from April now until October. And um, that should that's a really beautiful show called Taking Pause. So I think that about wraps it up for us. Everybody have a great night. And thanks again, let me, Maria. Let me, for being let, me, let me jump in with two real quick things. I just want to jump into two quick things. One is, let's not forget that this is sponsored by the Arts Council of Princeton. And we can always use help. Uh, so if you, you know, enjoyed the conversation and you uh, want to help contribute to the work that the Arts Council does to, to help children of all ages have access to art that they might not have otherwise had, and also support the work that's going on in the building uh, and also the public art we're doing, uh, including the, the Dome Alley, uh, artscouncilofprinceton.org and uh, contri contributions of any size are appreciated. So uh, we would really appreciate anything you would do. And Maria- and I wanna add one more thing. Um, the works, uh, not all of them, some of the works are on sale. Um, so if you go by the gallery and you like something, um, a percentage of the sales will go to the Arts Council um, to support all the other kinds of activities going on, education and all that. Great, that's a great thing. And Maria, it was a, really a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for um, showing up today. Okay, Maria, <laughs> back to you, Maria Evans. Good night, everybody, thank you. Good night, bye-bye.
Thank you.